Andrew Keogh, a normal average everyday Joe, had had enough of his financial struggles in life. He decided he would end his career as a farmer and a school board administrator to become a mass murderer. He took the lives of 38 children and six adults. Hello, my name is Janine, and this is the story of the Bath School bombing, and you're watching it on Now You Know. We're going to start our journey in Tecumseh, Michigan on February 1st, 1872. That is the day Andrew Philip Keogh was born. He was one of the youngest of 13 siblings. As he grew up, he developed a knack for tinkering. He would take apart anything he could get his hands on just so he could see how it would work, and then he'd put it back together again. He was constantly messing with his father's farm equipment, and he showed special interest in electricity. When Andrew reached the age of 18, he left home to attend Michigan State University to study electrical engineering. When completing his schooling, he moved to St. Louis, Missouri, where he found work as an electrician. Everything seemed to go well for Andrew until he received a head injury. This injury was so bad he was actually in a coma for about two weeks. After he got back up on his feet again, he moved back home with his father onto the farm. Sadly, while he was gone, his mother Mary had passed away and his father remarried within the same year. Andrew never liked or accepted his stepmother Frances Wilder. Now I'm going to stick in my two cents here. The loss of a mother is extremely hard to deal with. The grieving process is not easy. And whenever someone attempts to step in and fill a void that has not had time to heal, it will usually almost always cause problems. I'm speaking from this from personal experience here. If you at some point find yourself in this situation, my advice is don't rush to remarry. Allow yourself and your children, if you have them, time to grieve, adjust, and heal. Trust me, time is your friend when it comes to this. Anyway, back to Andrew. Like I had said, he never liked or accepted his stepmother, Frances Wilder. On September 17, 1911, Frances went to light the stove, and it exploded. She was soaked in fuel oil, and she was completely engulfed in flames. Andrew attempted to put out the flames by throwing a bucket of water on her. Unfortunately, all that did was cause the fire to spread. Eventually, it was put out, but Frances ended up dying the next day from her injuries. It has been speculated that the stove had been tampered with, but unfortunately, the investigation did not lead to an arrest. Shortly after the loss of his stepmother, Andrew married his college sweetheart, Ellen Nellie Price. She fell in love with Andrew because of his abilities to be dependable and structured. The couple moved to a farm outside of Bath, Michigan. At first, the community welcomed Andrew. He seemed to be very trustworthy and always willing to help with volunteer work or doing favors for others. But that quickly changed when they realized Andrew had a very short fuse. He once got annoyed with his neighbor's dog for barking, and he ended up shooting the poor thing. He also beat a horse to death because he didn't have the patience himself to properly train it. Now, it was reported that Andrew and Nellie were required to pay $122.60 in taxes in 1922. By 1926, it was raised to $198. Now, that doesn't seem like much to us nowadays, but in 1926, that would have been equal to about $3,100. That does seem pretty high. The main reason for the increase was the fact that the township wanted to consolidate all the small schools into one large one. The population of the township was only about 300 people, and the cost to build the school needed to come from somewhere. But everybody's taxes went up, not just Andrew's. Since Andrew was so good with record keeping, he thought he would be able to combat the rising taxes by becoming a trustee on the school board as well as treasurer. The only issue was Andrew seemed to be the only one not on board with the rest of the administration. He fought and argued over the smallest things, never wanting to invest in the school. He fought every expense, even if it would cost the children a lack in their education. But why would he be worried about the children? He didn't have any kids of his own to worry about. The lack in education was no skin off his nose. 
1925, Andrew was temporarily appointed to the position of the town clerk. This was a position he very much cared about, but come the next election, he lost his seat, and he felt publicly humiliated. On top of that, Andrew was slowly becoming financially ruined. He didn't have the money to pay his mortgage. The bank started the process of foreclosure. He fought and argued with the bank. He claimed that it was not fair. He stated that he would have been able to pay his mortgage if he didn't have such a huge tax obligation. He even vowed that if he can't live in his house, nobody will be able to. Neighbors started to take notice that he stopped working on the farm. He allowed it to go completely to seed. Nellie, his wife, was also no help to him, as she seemed to have been suffering from tuberculosis. Now, at the time, there was no treatment and no cure for that, and her medical bills started to pile up. It was clear that Andrew had hit rock bottom, and there was no way out. Around the time that he was voted out of office, Andrew started to gather some strange materials. Not in big quantities, a little here and a little there, over a long period of time. It was reported that he purchased a ton of pyrotol. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it was an explosive that was primarily used during World War I. But after the war, there was a surplus of it, and it was distributed across the country for farm work. Farmers mainly used it to remove tree trunks and to clear ditches. In addition to the pyrotol, he purchased dynamite. Now, that was not actually hard to come by either. It was usually sold in hardware stores and sporting goods stores. If people would become suspicious, Andrew just needed to explain that he was removing rocks and creating ditches on his farm. Neighbors reported constantly hearing explosions coming from his farm, but no actual farming was ever done. He even earned the nickname the Dynamite Farmer. And of course, he also stockpiled gasoline. Back then, it cost 21 cents per gallon, but in today's money, that would have been about equal to $3.52 per gallon. So that would have been considered pretty expensive back then. Now, as I said before, people trusted Andrew, and he was on the school board. He often did odd jobs at the school, so it wasn't abnormal to see him there in the off hours and during summer break. No one thought anything of it, but he was actually setting up explosives all throughout the basement of the school. This took months to do, and it was very surprising that no one noticed anything was wrong. In December 1926, he purchased a 30 caliber Winchester bolt-action rifle. Again, no red flags there. It's a hunting rifle, and he was a farmer. Perhaps he needed it to keep wildlife at bay or to provide food for him and Nellie. Before we go any further, if you guys could just take a moment and hit the like and subscribe button for this video, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now let's get back to the story. Around May 16th, Nellie was released from a long hospital stay. Andrew apparently didn't care to have her back home, and he decided to take her life. It was not reported how he did this, nor does it really matter. She was 51 years old at the time. After the fact, investigators found Andrew had left her body in a wheelbarrow, along with a cash box that was full of banknotes, and for some reason, all the silverware from the home was in the wheelbarrow with her. At 8.45 on the morning of May 18th, Andrew detonated a bomb inside his house. As the smoke rose, neighbors came to help and try and put out the fire and to save the home for Andrew and Nellie. They found it very odd when Andrew didn't seem to care. He got into his truck and yelled out the window, You guys should go to the school, before he drove off. As people were rushing to Andrew's home to help them with the fire, they heard another explosion. This one came from the direction of the school. Immediately, they all turned around and started heading that way. Parents showed up to find a portion of the school was missing. Debris was everywhere, including the bodies of the poor children who were inside when the dynamite and pyrotol Andrew had rigged with an alarm clock had detonated. The entire community was in a panic. Everyone desperately dug through the rubble to save the children. Some of the children were trapped under a portion of the roof that had collapsed. It's unknown if they were alive or not. A Mr. Ellsworth volunteered to run back to his farm to get the equipment they needed to move the roof. On his way there, he passed Andrew, not knowing that he had anything to do with the disaster at the time. 
He said as they passed each other, Andrew stuck his hand out the window and waved to him. He was smiling, but not just a regular smile, but one that showed everything, every tooth from ear to ear. It was clear Andrew was very happy with what he had succeeded in doing. The only problem was he wasn't done yet. Around 9.15, Andrew showed up to the school in his Ford truck, and it didn't take him long to spot the school administrator, Emery Hayek. Charles Halson was on the scene as well, and he noticed that Andrew waved Emery over to the truck. When he walked over, he noticed the two of them started fighting over what looked like a rifle. He was just starting to head over himself to see what was going on, but before he got there, Andrew's entire truck exploded. Andrew managed to kill himself and three others in that blast. The one was an eight-year-old, Cleo Clayton, who managed to survive the initial explosion at the school and was standing over there for safety. Sadly, Andrew took the lives of 38 children and six adults. That was bad enough. As it turns out, he had planned but failed to take many more lives. During the cleanup of the massacre, investigators found piles of explosives that were rigged to go off on the south side of the school. Luckily, Andrew's detonator failed to go off, sparing the lives of the other 198 children inside. So my question to you is, do you think the events in Andrew's life drove him into a deep depression until he finally snapped? Or do you think this was effect from the head trauma he had earlier in life? Or maybe perhaps do you think he was just a psycho? Investigators found at his farm one last note. It was on an old board he had wired to his fence. It stated, criminals are made, not born. Do you agree? I think it would also be wise to point out that they did find that all the money he had spent on the explosives and all the money that he would have made if he had sold the unused farm equipment that he had would have been more than enough to pay off his mortgage. This is noted to have been the worst school massacre in American history. If you're interested in more stories like this, I would suggest this one right here. As always, my dears, take care, stay safe, and thanks for listening.